just like to thank Brian and Ruth for uh, singing this evening. Whenever that piece started, that's a piece that we have just begun to sing. Lovely, lovely words, and thank you very much for your um, involvement in the service this evening. I wonder how often it is that you get the opportunity for a couple of hours and you haven't got, got a job planned to do and the grass was cut last week and you've just got two hours to choose what you can do with your time. wonder what would, in, in your uh, experience, be something that you would enjoy. Well, I have to admit to loving the opportunity sometime, especially if the house is, is empty, to put in a movie on and to maybe just to relax. Uh, and I really do enjoy, uh, and they're few and far between now, a really good courtroom drama, a real good uh, storyline and, and a, an awful lot going on within the courtroom. And if those of you that get an update from George to let you know what the title of his message is, well, he, he was pushing me all uh, Thursday evening and Friday for a title, and I said, well, courtroom drama George will do, and he, he did look at me, because maybe that's not the normal sort of title for a message. But I want you to walk with me as we start this evening into a courtroom. We walk into a courtroom and we look round, and what do we see first of all? Well, generally most courtrooms we would have a fairly uh, large gallery and, and, a, and a gathering of people, and some people in there would be there because they have a connection to, to maybe somebody that's um, un been unfortunate enough to have to attend court, or maybe if they're well-known people that have been involved in something, um, the journalists that are there and they want to get the story and be the first one to get that to, to the newspaper or to the, the TV in the evening. And then when we go beyond the... Um, the, the public gallery, we, we, we look across and we have 12 people sitting to one side and they're classed as the jury. And it is their responsibility to assess the evidence that is presented through that, that trial. And they eventually have the decision whether the person is to be found guilty or not guilty. And then across the front, we come to uh, the boys that start to wear the wigs and they have their black cloaks on and you've got the, uh, the prosecutor and he's the man that is going to try and prove beyond any reasonable doubt that the person that is in uh, the dock, that they are guilty of the offence. And then, as well as the, uh, the prosecutor, the other man next to him or the other lady, we live in a world where there's, there's plenty of legal representatives, um, ladies, and they also have their wig on and they are there to defend the person that has been brought into the courtroom that day. And then, of course, we look across and there's one solitary person, maybe looking a bit stressed and a bit worried and a bit concerned. And this is the accused. This is the person that has been brought in for whatever um, has been found to be um, done that was, was incorrect or, or whatever. And we live in a land where ultimately, and I say ultimately, our legal system is such, and if I'm wrong, Adele will point this out to me afterwards, so I'll do my best to be correct because we have um, legal people in the building this evening. But we have the, the law where we are innocent until proven guilty. Is that right, Adele? Innocent till proven guilty. And then we look towards the front, and there's a guy sitting there, and he's got the big red cloak on. And he's the judge, and he's the man that has to make sure that everything that happens in, he, in his courtroom is done correctly in terms of the law. And he has to then, once the, the foreman of the jury stand up at the end of the, the trial, whether it's days or weeks, and he says guilty or not guilty, well, he has the responsibility if a guilty plea, if a guilty verdict is given, the judge is the person that has to turn around and he has to hand down the sentence that is seen as the most appropriate thing for the, the crime that has been committed. That's the courtroom that I am picturing from the, from the movies that I've seen. I want to take you to a passage in John's Gospel and chapter 8. And this is not the same sort of courtroom, but essentially what we're going to see this evening 
hopefully is to take some lessons from this. So we're in John's Gospel, uh, chapter 8, and beginning at verse 2. Now early in the morning he came again, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery, and when, and when they had her set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? They said this, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. We trust the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his word this evening. So I asked the question, we've, we've described a modern day court scene and when all of a sudden we have um, a woman that has been thrust um, into a situation in the middle of the temple in, in a very public area. We see the, the scribes and the Pharisees uh, and I can only presume that this woman has been dragged from wherever she was caught, um, dragged in, in, in a group and probably a, a crowd of people has been uh, following um, the, 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 the scribes and the Pharisees through the town and she's been brought into the front of the temple where Jesus was teaching. Now the, the scribes and the Pharisees have very much taken on the role of prosecutor, judge, jury. In their own minds they have already got a guilty and they have already decided that her punishment is st stoning to death. And then we have this woman, a bit like our single person in the dock. No doubt harassed, scared, alone, with no support. I'm sure she must have felt very ganged upon by those that had been, um, that had taken her and that were demanding that she should be stoned to death. And then finally, we see the Lord Jesus Christ in the middle of the picture. I think in the same way that we can picture uh, a courtroom, we can quite easily picture maybe very easily this evening the commotion and the drama that would be going on in this area at the time. I'm sure the crowd were angry, they were demanding uh, her death by stoning. A very serious, stressful um, and volatile situation. I want to simply consider the three different characters or groups of people this evening. Um, and apply what we learn to um, our service this evening. The first one is the woman caught in adultery. Verse 3 actually says that she was caught in the very act. It would seem from this that the, uh, the evidence was undeniable. The woman was obviously guilty of being caught in, in adultery. I'm sure our local police would love the opportunity to be able to arrest somebody caught in the very act of something, somebody that's involved in stealing a car. They would just love to be the one that comes around the corner when the guy's got the window smashed and he's arming through the window and pull out the warrant card and arrest somebody. But so often that doesn't happen. But in this situation, this woman had been caught in the very act. Now we've got to remember that we are looking back um, over 2,000 over 2, years probably, and the culture at the time would have been very different. 
I'm interested to note that nowhere in Scripture do we ever hear a word from this woman until the Lord Jesus Christ speaks to her. She wasn't protesting her innocence. Um, after all, um, there must have been a man involved for adultery to have taken place. And we don't see him being dragged along with her. So she was indeed alone. She had no legal um, barrister standing next to her who would be seeking to make sure that everything was done correctly. Maybe she'd already accepted in her mind. She knew the law. She knew the punishment that went, that went with it. I don't know how often this type of thing happened. There's every chance that this woman may have seen this happen time and time again and was therefore very aware that what she'd been caught doing, because it was wrong, that ultimately death would be her, her due um, because of that. In human terms, there was no way she was going to get away with what had happened on that occasion. We, we have a, a saying very much at the, uh, in, in society today, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. That's very much to say, if you're not willing to pay the punishment, then don't do the thing that's wrong and you stand no chance of being punished. It's fair to say that we live in a society now where so many people say there is so little deterrent for, for young people to do things, maybe to steal things, because there's, there's hardly anything going to be done to them. This is a time that was very different. People were punished severely for doing wrong. I remember um, many years ago, Gordon Coulter came home from a, a business trip to Dubai and told me a story that he visited his nephew who was um, a very senior engineer on a project in, in Dubai. And as he came over across the building site, um, he was being taken up 800 foot onto the, um, the roof of the hotel to where the helipad was. And Gordon being Gordon, if those of you that know him, the next minute the wallet fell out the pocket and he went to lift it up. And he said, oh, I need to keep that safe. And this guy turned around and said, no, just give it to me, Gordon. And he took a, a wallet, full of cash and he put it on top of a barrel in the middle of a building site and he says we'll pick that up when we come down. They went up on the roof and they spent the time up there looking round, came back down maybe 15, 20 minutes later and went over and he picked the wallet up and he put it in his pocket. And Gordon turned round to him and said well how can you be that sure that that would still be there? He said if anybody was caught stealing that, he says they lose the hand. So this is the same sort of thing, the punishment suited the crime at the time. You know, for those of us, as I look round at that, that work, we expect at the end of a week, having worked hard, to get paid for what we've done. Romans 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe those are words that you find offensive. I remember at 16 years of age being confronted with the truth uh, that I had sin in my life. Um, to be honest, looking back, I didn't have a great deal of difficulty accepting that there was sin within my life. This woman, I feel, because she didn't respond in any way, had very much accepted the punishment that was coming her way. But maybe this evening you feel that you are substantially different, substantially better than this woman. We can quite easily think to ourselves that murderers and child abusers and people that conduct violent crimes, that they are, they are what we would call as true sinners. But we feel that to be lumped in with that group would not be right. Well, let's move on. So if you don't feel a connection with this woman, who has been um, accused of something and is guilty as a result of what the law says. Then maybe as we come to look at the scribes and the Pharisees, maybe you'll start to feel a little bit more comfortable because this group of people, they were the upright people very much in society of the time. They, they were probably, some of them, very wealthy and popular. People looked up to them. They were involved in, in society. They were maybe people that owned... Um, businesses 
in the local area and different things. They were the, the, the good people. They sought to set a very good um, example in the community. We would probably say of them today that they were you know, some of the upstanding members of the community in their time. They seemed to be the people that knew the law um, and obviously wanted to follow it. Good people, law-abiding people. Um, and because this woman had been caught doing something wrong, they probably felt their obligation to make sure that the law was brought to task and that she paid the penalty for what had been done. If we look at verse 5 and 6, we read these verses, from, these verses from the passage. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? They said this testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. Now that would seem to indicate that on, on face value what they're doing looks to be correct. They're bringing somebody that has been caught doing wrong um, to try and punish them. But yet what we actually see is that they're, they're using this situation uh, to try and catch the Lord Jesus Christ. So it seems to indicate that maybe the Pharisees and the scribes, that the better people of society, maybe they're not just as good as they thought they were. Maybe this is a slight chink in, in their flawless armour. On face value they look the part, but below the surface maybe they weren't just so pure. Now all of a sudden, I believe if we, we, we think about our, our, our story that we've read, the mood begins to change. I believe the stress, the shouting and all the excitement seems to start to, to die down when the Lord Jesus Christ um, is brought into the, the situation. We can imagine that the Lord Jesus Christ was teaching, the woman was brought over and I would say she was very much just flung into the, into the front of the group and I can nearly see the group sort of standing back and this woman uh, almost standing um, in the middle as very much as accusations were being thrown at her. And then all of a sudden we see the situation where the Lord Jesus Christ comes into that picture. So all of a sudden we've now got the, the crowd that begin to watch the interaction between the Lord Jesus and this woman. And verse 6 tells us, but Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. He took the attention very much now away from the woman. The crowd had been hurling accusations at her, but all of a sudden now, everybody's eyes, I'm sure, are drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he lowered himself from their gaze and started to write on the floor. And I'm sure these people were quite puzzled and I have to say, I, I turned to a few commentaries to try and find out, well, what are the possible things that he was writing on the floor that took their attention? And it seems to be the usual. Whenever you're trying to prepare for something, you just can't find the answers to the questions that you've got in your head. But I did find this one um, plausible explanation. And I want to just refer back to a, a verse in, in Exodus. And this is when the Lord was... Uh, when Almighty God was given um, the Ten Commandments to Moses. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. I have the facility in what I do at work that I have a machine that can be programmed to engrave. I wouldn't like to start getting a piece of stone and expect that my finger would make any sort of impact. But the, the Pharisees of the time would be aware of this, the giving of the law to Moses. And maybe this was to just emphasise that the very hand that wrote the law on those tablets of stone belonged to the person that was now crouched down in front of them, that they were quizzing about whether what was being done was right or wrong. I leave you to make your own decision on that. If you have another imp interpretation, please feel free to, to stick with what you feel comfortable with. After all, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was now the key player in the drama. 
Verse 7 says, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. What a question. What a question to ask these upright people. Surely from the way they brought this person to him, they were all good enough to lift a stone and to throw it. So why did the Lord Jesus Christ ask this question? Well, I believe he wanted to, to bring to their attention the situation for them to think personally. And I want to ask you the question to put yourselves into that situation tonight, to join that group of onlookers at this woman that had been caught doing this dreadful thing that was deserving of death. And I want to ask you, in all honesty, could we lift a stone and could we cast it at her? Because we read, one by one, they began to leave. The oldest first. Now, it's not fair to say, and please, I don't want you to take this, it's not fair to say just because the, the oldest left first because they had, had committed the most amount of sins. But in reality, the longer you live, the more things we, d- we do wrong. But it says that they were convicted by their own conscience. The Lord Jesus Christ had basically challenged them to look at their own lives to see if they were good enough, if they were without sin and were willing to throw the stone. And it says that they weren't. And what we see here is the actions of these individuals speak louder than words because one by one, the scripture says they left. This proves Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We started off with our first woman that we said was an undeniable person. We listed a group of of people like murderers and robbers and people that we feel quite definitely fit the category of of people that should be down there and we elevate maybe ourselves. But all of a sudden what they had been asked to do and what their actions proved is that not one person in the gathering that day was really any different to her. Maybe they had never committed the sin that she'd committed, but ultimately every one of them was admitting by the actions of not lifting the stone that they had a sin problem themselves. So we've dealt with two different people this evening, and I just want to, in the time that remains, look now at the, 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 the final character and the way the Lord Jesus Christ dealt with this situation and what this has to to say to us this evening. His presence made a dramatic change to that situation. It brought a calmness. The hostility and the stress had gone and ultimately um, that situation changed. We don't know whether the woman had ever seen the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no way of knowing this evening had she ever heard of his teaching. And maybe even this evening there's there's individuals here that have never been confronted with those truths and in a similar situation. But I think she must have been completely amazed as this group that had been so hostile towards her one by one just disappeared. And I think she must have been standing there in complete and utter amazement. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, verse 10 tells us, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? We've already learned that they left having examined themselves, realising in truth that they were also had this sin problem and maybe accepting that they are also deserving of a level of punishment as a result of that. But what do we see? 
this woman standing here with the Lord Jesus Christ. The, the judges and the jury of the scribes and Pharisees, they had gone. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, we read these words, The Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. The righteous judge was now in front of her and was, would have had every right to have condemned this woman because he was perfect. He was the only one in that gathering that was without sin. But what does he turn around and do to her? He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. The opening chorus of our uh, first hymn this evening was, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. This is where true freedom comes from. And Brian and Ruth in their first piece brought us to Calvary and their second piece focused upon the freedom that comes when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord Jesus Christ told her to go and to sin no more. He gave her the option to live, but a change would be necessary within her life. He made that comment that he didn't want to condemn her. John 3 and 17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. In the last couple of moments that we have, I simply want to explain what is on offer, why, and how this evening. We've established a number of things. Sin has to be punished. Sin will never be allowed to enter into heaven. We've established that we've all got sin within us and therefore we all have a great need. That verse tells us that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, he came to save the world. That verse obviously, John 3, 17, comes after probably the most famous gospel verse in scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, the end of that verse. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathise with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. This is why the Lord Jesus Christ stands this evening as the only person that can bring salvation, the only person that can turn round to any individual and say that he doesn't condemn them. Jesus came to be born to live in the human existence uh, through our Christmas story. We don't read that from birth until his ministry started at 30 years of age that he was wrapped in cotton wool and protected. We read that he was te tempted by Satan, Satan in the wilderness. But every time we read of these things, we realise that he remains sinless. So when we think of Calvary this evening, we realise that the Lord Jesus Christ went to Calvary as the sinless Lamb of God. That what he took upon himself, upon Calvary's cross, was the punishment that was due for me and for each one of us. So I simply say in closing tonight that we have a choice to make. Whatever age we are, we can choose to re reject everything that we've been looking at this evening. Or indeed we can choose to agree with the words uh, that we find in Matthew 27, the words uh, that are uttered by the centurion who stood before the Lord Jesus Christ as he hanged upon Calvary's cross and as he finally um, died. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. So the choice is this evening, we either respond to the truth that the Son of God is the only one that can bring salvation, the only one that can offer forgiveness of sins, the only one that can extend true mercy and grace 
towards each one of us. Or we walk out of the door and it's like picking up the gun in a game of Russian roulette and spinning the barrel and putting the gun to your head because it's just potluck. The only true um, satisfaction that we can find, the only true peace that we can find with God this evening is to come and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to speak to me at the door, please feel free to do so on the way out or alternatively speak to a, a trusted Christian friend. Now I've chosen not to finish with the closing hymn. I'm, I'm going to ask Alan to just play um, a track that really I'm sure if you sit quietly, close your eyes and listen to the words, hopefully it just completes the passage that we've been looking at this evening and then I'll close in prayer. Thank you. <laughs>